Wednesday morning, November 21st, 1950. A troop train travels through the mountains of British Columbia. On board are 340 soldiers, members of the Royal Canadian Artillery. They have traveled all the way from Camp Shiloh in Manitoba, where they began their military training, and are on their way to Fort Lewis in Washington to receive further training before being shipped to the war in Korea. 21-year-old Arden Acheson is one of them, the eldest son of Prairie Homesteaders. He was so much like Dad. He was like my dad, you know. He played the violin. He was a very good violin player. He'd go to dances. He'd come home, and he'd be whistling a tune that he heard at the dance. And he'd take his violin down, and he'd learn to play that tune before he went to bed. And I could always hear my dad say, I didn't get to bed and put that thing up. And I can remember that as plain as day. The war in Korea has given Arden a new chance after losing a trucking business and finding himself among the unemployed. There was no work in those days, and they were enlisting men on the street in Metal Lake. And he come home, happy as a lark, I can remember this, and my mom started crying right away, that he joined the Army. When he left that morning, she said, we'll never see that boy again. On November 21st, Arden Acheson rides in one of the old wooden coaches retired from regular service, but reinstated by the railway for troop transport. All the cars on the inside, they had uh, sleepers, and all the uh, woodwork was uh, cedar woodwork, you know, it looked really nice. Mechanic John Stables and gunner Tom Dusum also ride in coaches close to the front of the train. Although he has also worked for the railway, Tom shares Arden Acheson's view that the Army is the opportunity of a lifetime. I was a track foreman. I had my own section. But uh, it's felt like an endless, endless job to me. And although I had a wonderful wife and nice children, something said I had to do something else to get ahead a little bit. At 9.30 a.m., the troop train pulls into Red Pass Station so the crew can receive orders for the final leg of the journey. With the train stopped, 35-year-old fireman Hank Proskinuk performs a routine inspection of the locomotive. He enjoys working with his friend, engineer Harvey Church. In fact, he bumped another fireman from this trip so he could be part of the crew. Harvey Church was one of his favorite engineers, and when Hank found out he booked on, he jumped at the chance. 49-year-old Harvey Church has been a railroader most of his life. He loved to travel. As a result, we always had a railway pass. And whenever there was a break from school, my father would see that we were would go to Vancouver or we would go to the prairies in the summer. He was very, very kind and thoughtful, even when things were tough. My father was uh, an engineer, so that meant he was responsible for, of course, the power that pulls a train. It was not a regular run for either of these men because troop trains were what they called extras. They weren't a regular train. Since the troop train isn't part of the daily timetable, its crew requires special orders that tell them where they must stop to let the higher priority passenger trains go by. They have pulled in this morning at Red Pass Station to pick up those orders from the operator, 22-year-old John Atherton. Red Pass at that time was very busy. It was an agency, so you would have people coming for tickets. Then you could have people at the wicket hollering at you and a section crew wanting a lineup. It was a hot foot job, that Red Pass job. The order originally relayed to Atherton directs the westbound troop train listed as number 3538 to stop at Cedarside Station and allow the eastbound passenger train known as the number two to continue through. From there, the troop train is to continue west to Gosnell, where it will allow a second passenger train, the number four, to go by. However, when operator John Atherton writes out the message, he inadvertently omits the word Cedarside. With that word missing, 
The order now tells the troop train crew to continue past Cedarside and pull into Gosnell to wait for both passenger trains. They concluded the dispatcher's trying to move us as far as he can, and this number two is late, so he'll be at Gosnell waiting for us and have the switch line. So fair enough, we're going to take the siding at Gosnell for both trains, and one is right behind the other. Meanwhile, the number two passenger train has received the correct train orders and will not be waiting at Gosnell. Instead, it heads for Cedarside, where it expects the troop train to stop and let it pass. Jack Stinson is the engineer on number two, a 64-year-old veteran with only six months to retirement. He was quite the guy. He had one of these pipes that had a bow in it with a little tin lid on the pipe. And he always had his head out the window. And he didn't matter how cold it was, he always had his head out the window. Station agent Bill Fisher is hitching a ride on the eastbound passenger train after finishing a midnight shift. His friend, 39-year-old Adam Oleschuk, is the fireman. He was much like Jack. They, they made a good pair, very good pair. Plus, he was a good whist player. <laughs> we had fun like playing whist and, you know, keeping each other company. Adam wants his friend to keep him company on this trip, too by riding up front in the engine. I told him, no, I, I was tired. I thought I'd ride the day coach and at least get a little sleep. While he doesn't know it at the time, Bill Fisher's decision has momentous implications for his fate. Wednesday, November 21st, 1950. In the mountains of British Columbia, a troop train travels on its way to the United States. Inside the old wooden coaches, 340 Canadian soldiers on their way to Korea are enjoying the mountain scenery. Many play cards to pass the time, and some are luckier than others. I was invited to play in the poker game. So I had $2, and I would played for two hours with that 40 nickels, and I lost every game. It is 10.35 a.m. Tom Dusum loses his last nickel and decides to call it quits. As he makes his way back to his seat, the train passes the hamlet of Canoe River. At the head end, fireman Hank Proskinuck stokes the boilers as engineer Harvey Church guides the troop train around a gentle uphill curve. On the other side of the curve, Engineer Jack Stinson and Fireman Adam Oleschuk ease their eastbound passenger train downhill, its 10 steel coaches tight against their steam locomotive. 10.40 a.m. As the two trains enter the blind curve, they have no way of knowing they are headed on a collision course. On an embankment above, forestry worker Bill Tyndall sees the two trains heading towards each other. Then he realized that there's no way this passenger train's stopping, and he was trying to wave to Olachuk. As he continues around the curve, engineer Harvey Church is shocked to see the passenger train less than 150 meters away. If it had been just seconds later, you might have got a glimpse of one of them, you know, coming around. But they met exactly on the curve. Just couldn't be worse. At that point, he would have two or three seconds. Maybe not even that to do something. The terrible impact sends both engines skyward, then back on the cars directly behind them. The wooden coaches at the front of the troop train telescope inward as steel cars from the rear smash into them. Soldiers inside are pitched forward as baggage, seats, and debris crash down. To make matters worse, the impact cracks the boilers on both locomotives. Adam Oleschuk and Jack Stinson are crushed by the impact. Harvey Church and Hank Proskinuck are hit by the scalding steam. The horror of steam is that it's all compressed. So the minute you get that opening, the uh, pressure drops, and then the, all the water boils, and so the boiler blows. You can imagine the horrific amount of steam that's generated, which is so expansive. Eh? <laughs> a cloud of steam and water envelops the first few cars of the troop train. 
The momentum hurls several coaches off the track and down the embankment. Gunner Tom Dusum's coach also leaves the rails, skidding dangerously toward the edge. It was a distinct hit, and I grabbed onto the back of the seat hang on. When the car started to roll, my seat come off. I had nothing to hang on to. And I fell. There were three other guys beside me. They were down, too. When everything settled, we were upside down. 21-year-old Arden Atchison is caught in the front cars. Scalding steam, wood, and steel bury him in a massive pile of wreckage. As the coaches come to rest, passengers from both trains stumble outside, then stand shocked at the extent of the damage. The people on number two, interestingly enough, uh, got shaken up, but that's about it. There wasn't that many people on there. We all thought we must have, must have been an avalanche. And I rushed out, and when I looked up there, stuff was piled all up, you know. I said, my god. You had to think the worst day. No question about it. There was just nobody, but nobody was going to come out of that. Despite their injuries and confusion, the soldiers immediately go to work to pull comrades from shattered coaches. Some were dead, some were you know, burnt, badly burnt. That's the steam. That wood that was in there that said it's cedar, it's splintered and things. It, uh, people were stabbed with that. Others, uh, they just got squeezed between two things and a lot of them died. Tom Dusum and several other soldiers look for a way out of their overturned coach. The, the other guys were standing, and I said, don't, don't move, or, because the car was like that. And, and I thought we were going to keep going down the mountain. Fortunately, the crumpled coach is stable, and Tom and his fellow soldiers are able to crawl to safety through a hole in the roof. Well, as soon as we got out, we went right down to the front of the car, right to where, where, where it was buried. I do remember boys were crying down there. We knew they were crying down there because they were they are burning, eh? You could hear them, but you couldn't help them. They were burnt, eh? There's no way out of them, if, even if they are alive. Two cars on the passenger train become hospital rooms for the injured, and a third becomes a morgue for the dead. Dr. Patrick Kimmett, a young physician traveling on the passenger train, cares for the injured until medical personnel arrive four hours later. In the meantime, news of the wreck spreads rapidly along the main line, but details are sketchy. When I got home, my mother said yes, that it had been my father's accident. And my mother said, uh, uh, no, I don't think there's any concern. And about six o'clock, one of my mother's very dear friends came and in tears said, Jenny, uh, Harvey's missing. And probably uh, that's one of the very few times I saw my mother ever break down. Tom Dusum's wife, Jean, receives a telegram that her husband has been critically injured in the crash. And I thought, oh, ho, ho, he must be dead, he must be dead. And here I thought, I'm left with three little babies, and one, he only saw her when she was two weeks old. And uh, the next day, my uncle came, I could see him running with a newspaper coming to our house. He said, look, Gene, there's nothing wrong with Tommy. Look, that's him right there on the newspaper. And he was on the front, front page. And then I thought, oh, he's all right, you know. Tom Dusum is one of the lucky ones. 17 soldiers die that November day. Five of them were playing cards with Tom just before the crash. If he hadn't left the game when he did, he would have died with them. It wasn't any fun, but it was fortunate for me that I lost my two dollars and I never won one pot. Another casualty is Arden Atchison, whose mother predicted he would never return. The morning that we heard on the radio that there was a troop train crash, and there was, I think, nine Saskatchewan boys on there, uh, she just knew then Arden was one of them. She just knew that. The remains of crewman Jack Stinson, Adam Oleschuk, and Hank Proskinuk are identified but engineer Harvey Church's body is not found until the following spring. 
The final death toll is 21, with more than 50 seriously injured. Yet if the accident had occurred just minutes earlier, it could have been worse. Because what happened maybe about uh, a couple of miles before, we may have been crossing the, the Canoe River. And if it would have hit there, I don't think I'd have been here. I would be here today. At an inquiry, operator John Atherton admits that the accident would not have happened if he had noticed the word Cedarside was missing from the train order. The man made a mistake. Just pure, plain and simple, he made a blunder. One word, one damn word. Despite the tragic circumstances surrounding the cause of the accident, it does bring about important changes to railway procedure. It clearly pointed out that the rule book did not have enough safeguards in it. And as a result of that, a new rule book came up with changes in it. They put the automatic block system in on that particular track. We went from uh, train orders and telegraph to centralized traffic control. I'd say it's foolproof, period, unless somebody tampers with the system. In over 70 countries around the world, war memorials commemorate the men and women who sacrificed their lives in the fight for freedom, many of them Canadians. In Canada, there are monuments that also remember those who died in the service of their country, but not on the battlefield. In November 2003, the 17 soldiers killed at Canoe River are officially recognized for their contribution and counted among the 516 Canadian casualties of the Korean conflict. You see some of the parents, and they're always thankful that we hold this memorial, that, that these guys are veterans. And they were, uh, they were awarded to the uh, uh, the uh, a medal, the Korea for going to Korea, volunteer service medal, and those they they were sent to the people of the person that was killed. We class them as veterans of the Korea War, so, and that's the way it should be. Many also count as heroes the four crewmen who died that same day. We lay wreaths for those railroad people and we treat them as brothers, really. Today, in St. John's, Newfoundland, a coffee shop stands on the site where the Knights of Columbus Hostel burned to the ground. Nearby, a special memorial erected in 1991 honors those who died in the fire. What we decided then, we would have a memorial every year in memory of the 99 lost, and we have it on December the 12th, at 11 o'clock in the night, and we have a little ceremony, and then we read the full 99 names, uh, and various people take part in uh, reading the names. It's great just to let the people just remember, not just the people who lost the fires, but why they're there, what they represent us. They're all part of the war effort, and that's why we shall never, shall never forget. <laughs>